you know, yep. walking like around Roxanne. in the dirt. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, that was a little long. <laughs> just having fun with it. You're just having fun with it. It's okay. It's mystery okay. Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to mystery TV. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies. Oh, boy, are there loonies in this episode. <laughs> and everything else we love. This week, Murdoch Mysteries Season 1, Episode 13, The Annoying Red Planet. Ooh, it's so annoying. It's so annoying. <laughs> No. If you let your children go to Mars. No, if you let them suck out people's viscera with the shop vac. Yeah, that's they can true. watch Either this one episode, of those things, listen to this episode. They can listen to this episode. <laughs> I'm Sarah. And I'm Mark. And we're going to spoil this. So if you haven't seen this episode, The Annoying Red Planet, then uh, pause now, go watch it, and come back because we're going to ruin it for you. <laughs> Though the, it's kind of weird at the end. <laughs> Yeah? Yeah. You think so? It's a little weird. It's more than a little. A <laughs> couple of bits of business beforehand. Uh, we are preparing and collecting and getting ready to send off a donation to Target Ovarian Cancer from your merch sales from the first six months of the year. For the second six months of the year, we will be raising money for Partners in Health. Mm-hmm. P- Partners in Health is responding to the maternal health emergency in Sierra Leone, you may have heard of them through the Vlog Brothers, which is a YouTube sensation. John group. Green and his brother. Yes, who was just diagnosed with cancer. So everybody's talking about that. Yep. Um, they have a great video on, uh, on YouTube of the hospital they're building. And they're building a hospital. I've been getting socks from their awesome sock of the month club for over a year now, two years, um, and the proceeds of that go. And to partners in health too. It's like, very cool. If you if you need some convincing that this is an important thing, the maternal deaths per hundred thousand in uh, the United States is nineteen. Mm-hmm. In Sierra Leone in twenty nineteen, it was eleven hundred and twenty out of a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand. Okay, I yeah. thought you said a hundred. No, no. Wow. For every 10,000 patients, they have a quarter of a doctor and nine nurses. That's it for for 10,000 people. Wow. And then uh, one in 17 women in Sierra Leone is at risk of death during pregnancy. That's so scary. So they're building the hospital. They're helping women. They're helping little babies. 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 And if you watch the video, they're also educating and training women in Sierra Leone to build the hospital. Yeah, and all kinds of construction jobs and skilled labor jobs. Absolutely fantastic. So that's where our merch sales profits are going to go for the second six months of this year. So go buy yourself a Murder Mayhem Loonies and everything else we love t-shirt. Yes. Somebody asked if we could get it printed with light writing instead of dark writing because yeah. they wanted it on a an, a shirt that was reversed. Yeah, and sure. And we'll put that up in the shop sometime this week. Yep, I already prepped that file. Yep. I just didn't post it yet, so yep. happy to do it. Uh, we also have an exciting announcement about our next episode. Bum, ba, da, ba. Our next episode is another interview with a person on a television show. I cannot believe I'm saying that. Yes. And that Badland was excellent. And next we're going to interview Jerry Iwu. Iwu, who plays Felix, Felix Livingston. On Sister Boniface. Sister Boniface. He's the young police sergeant. Yes. And he's Detective fantastic Constable, young man. I remember. Yeah. And uh, we're going to interview him and post that. That will be going out on June the 12th. Yep. Then we're going to take a week off and then return on June 26th with Murdoch Mysteries Season 2, Episode 1, Mild Mild West. Yeah. We're going to do Season 2 of Murdoch. Then we'll reevaluate. But we don't know. We're not. We're not saying that we're all. We're going to do all sixteen seasons of Murdoch, but we're going to go ahead and do season two. Everybody seems to be having fun with it. So everybody seems to now, like. However, if Midsummer Murders episodes drop from the sky, er, record yep. scratch, stop. Whatever we're doing, they take precedence. They always take precedence. Absolutely. So don't worry. We'll get there. Yes, absolutely. Oh, and. 
Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary is our 15th anniversary today that we're recording. Our wedding anniversary. Yes, We've not our, been doing a podcast for no, 15 no, years. No, no, That'd no. be kind of crazy. No, though our fourth anniversary will be in July. That's crazy, too. That's insane. Wow. Not as insane as this episode. Oh, boy. <laughs> Martians! Originally aired April 13th, 2008, directed by Sean Thompson, who has a heavy hand in this episode, Mm -hmm. and written by Paul Aitkins. I love this episode. So the name of this episode is uh, The Annoying Red Planet. Do you know why it's called that? No. It is clearly... I mean, Mars is the red planet. Yes, but it's clearly taking off... A 1959 movie called The Angry Red Planet. Oh, is that about Mars too? Yes. Uh, One of two, one of only two survivors from the Martian expedition is so traumatized she doesn't remember the circumstances of the trip. It is fantastic 1959 sci-fi. Is she angry? Oh, no. The uh, Martians are very angry, though. (laughs) Of course they are. But it's a really well-known kind of B movie from the 50s, and it's just spectacularly goofy, and their suits are weird, and, like, all the things they see on Mars are like, you're like, no. No. (laughs) No, that's not the way it is. And there's this big, crazy kind of mouse bat spider thing. Mouse bat spider? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, that's something I don't want to see. Yep. Thing of nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty scary. So Mouse and bat are pretty close, but then you add the spider thing in and I'm out. Stars Gerald Moore, Nora Hayden, and Les Tremaine. Have you never heard of any of those people? Never. That gives you an indication of that movie. So this episode is the last in season one, and if you've never watched Murdoch and you don't know, this is kind of the introduction to an important recurring character and recurring plot. So we get, this is the intro to Terrence Myers. Terrence Myers. Who is not a good guy, not a bad guy, but he's always up to something and yep. he represents the government. Yep. So he's like... CIA guy. Yeah, he's the equivalent of a spy that works for the government. Yes, so. um, who is constantly coming to Murdoch to have him help with stuff. So this is where we meet him for the first time, which is fantastic. Uh, another thing, and I you're was, not supposed to like him. So no. if you if you hate him, then that's okay because <laughs> that's kind of who he if is. you hate him now. Oh, I'm just wait. <laughs> betting you're the, you're going to learn to love him at some point. Maybe he's awesome. <laughs> He's horribly good, bad guy. Yeah. Uh, just another thing off the top, uh, all the Canadians who watched this episode, especially those from Ontario, were probably going, that's nowhere near that, and that is nowhere near that. Okay, the geography of this episode is completely wrong. The Rouge River Valley does exist. Jerseyville does exist. They exist maybe 250 miles apart. You mean uh, they're not 20 miles outside of Toronto? Yeah, the jurisdiction of Mur- of Murdoch to do this is weird. <laughs> uh, the Just st- suspend geographical disbelief. Where the office of that uh, land management company is? Mm-hmm. Where is that office? I, no, no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, just, I just wanted to say off the top that all of the geography is wrong for this episode. Does the Rouge Valley at least have a big dam in no. it or no. anything? No? No, no, no. Is no. that a reservoir? No. Oh, no. so it never happened. Yes. Terrence Myers was foiled. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So just, I just have to tell you this because I'm so excited to tell you this. The actor who plays Terrence Meyer, his his name is, I'm going to say Callahan. I'm going to guess that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, now, he's not a series regular in the future, but he he's appears a recurring in every character. episode. But the actor. Every, sorry, every season. Yeah. Even if you think, clearly, Terrence Meyer could not survive this. Yeah, and then he just shows up. But the actor was in a movie I've never seen, and I'm surprised I've never seen it, called Duct Tape Forever. Duct Tape Forever. It is the Red Green movie. Ah, uh, yes. Duct Tape Forever, the Red From Green From 2002. Movie. Yep. Yep. If you've never seen Red Green, he is the Canadian... Ah. Uh, Tim the Toolman Taylor. Yeah, but... But it's different. But way goofier. A super goofy. Funnier. 
Yeah. I, 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 we used to, we used to catch episodes of red green on our public broadcasting station. And he used to say, if the ladies don't find you handsome, at least let them find you handy. <laughs> and I will never forget that. Yep. It's kind of like <laughs> It is that. a low budget, goofy show. It's so funny. It's kind of cornball comedy. But very Canadian. With lots of it duct tape so and Canadian. lots of very Canadianism. Yeah. So Terrence Myers is in the duct tape movie. I did, I did not know that. Elmer, stop! <laughs> I love I love Henry Gaston hanging from a tree. It's right off. It's weird. You can't explain it. And you're like, how are they going to get out of this? I don't want you getting too close, Elmer. Um, so they're in Jerseyville, right? Yes. Is Jerseyville back in time? No. <laughs> okay. Because it looks like pioneer land. It, well, it, well, so outside of Toronto, this is what, Canada would have looked like in log cabins and bonnets. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's like fifty years behind Toronto. Yeah. And like I'm surprised they're not like, hey, you newfangled coppers with your zips and stuff. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. Okay. So George has been called out because there's a crime. So I'm gonna assume that in the world of Murdoch. The Toronto Constabulary is kind of like Scotland Yard in that they have a wide jurisdiction because they get called out for serious crimes in nearby areas, even if they aren't in Toronto. That's what I'm going to pretend happened. And okay. that's why they're out there. OK, so George gets called out because Henry Gaston yes. is hanging from a tree and there and George says there are no footprints leading up to the tree in this newly plowed field. So how did he get up there? Yes. So there are two things that are interesting here that go right along with this. First is the director's hand in what's called a zolly. Okay. And what a zolly is, is you, you turn the zoom of the camera mm -hmm. as you're moving the camera. So it's zoom plus dolly. Yes. So the camera's on a dolly. Yep. And it's moving backwards while it's zooming in. Both. So we get this... Yeah. Vroomph effect. Yes. And right? it's most well known for in the movie Vertigo and Jaws. There's a very okay. famous scene in Jaws. Because this has so much in common with Vertigo and Jaws. Well, it's supposed to put you off-putting. Yeah. And that's what it does, it right? Is, it like, is it immediately puts you off that, because they're only referring to seeing Henri Gaston in the tree. Mm -hmm. You don't see him. They're like, I don't know what it is. And, and you then know, we do see him. So that's why they do that. Then you have to have talk about Henry and Chekhov's criminal. <laughs> because Henry mentions this criminal and then it's cleverly forgotten yeah, about we just for get the this last 10 minutes. We get this quick cut back to station four. It's like, meanwhile, at station four, Henry is walking around going, Hey, there's a confidence man on the loose. Here's what he looks like. Everybody keep keep an eye out. Yep. Meanwhile, back in Jerseyville. <laughs> there's a mom, mom. I got the part there too. <laughs> Right, right at the oh, very the criminal that they're manning. There, there's like this the grunting criminal yeah. coming through. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I hear Gaston, I can't not think of Beauty and the Beast <laughs> because I'm broken like that. Because there's the character in Beauty and the Beast in the the Disney cartoon version whose name is Gaston, who is nothing like this character. Oh gosh, no! But I don't care. I thought the same the, thing. The it song. says in my notes. Gaston. Because this song, you know, the no one's slick as Gaston, no one's quick as Gaston, no one's neck is incredibly thick as Gaston. My favorite line of that is he says at an aside, I'm especially good at expectorating. And then he spits. <laughs> do you want to hear my version? Well, okay. Or do you want me to do it later? Because I wrote my own version Did about ver this Gaston. Did Let's do your version later because it has some clues to what okay, happened. Okay, okay. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil forget. the spoilers. We won't forget. I took a lot of time writing these lyrics. No. Mark. Oh, we'll get to Gaston. I'm surprised he didn't die of having horrible facial hair. What is up with that facial hair? He's got lamb chops out the wazoo. Like yep. they wrap around his nose and go yep. back the opposite direction and up around his head and just chop, chop, chops all How over the place. How did he get up that tree? 
How did they get him out of the tree? George climbing trees. He climbs a lot of trees in this episode. I mean, I don't, I, I, I guess they could have tied a rope around him and lowered him down. I guess. But there's only the two of them, Murdoch and George. I, I don't know. It would have been. He would have been, been heavy. It would have been difficult. The plow, the field was just plowed and there are no footprints. Maybe they just snipped his scarf and he just fell the rest of the way. <laughs> Bouncing off branches. He's not going to feel it. He's already dead. It's fine. George, get us some bicycles. Daisy, dude. <laughs> Did you see the transition There's there? so many cuts. Yeah. Yes. I can't believe Julia is listening to Daisy Daisy in the mortuary. Yeah. In the morgue. I mean, classical music, maybe, but give me your answer, do. Did you see her blackboards? mm It's all brain. She's like dissecting people's brains and... <laughs> Putting where they should be. And brains, brains. Brains, brains. You know, because in her, in her free time. I, again, Julia gets to make an awesome morgue joke. They're talking about the hangman's calculation. She says, she kills it. Too long and the head just comes off. <laughs> <laughs> and Murdoch's like, uh, okay. I don't want to be alone with you. That's kind of scary. And then somewhere in the background, while they're filming this, there's a writer going, wait a minute. That makes an idea for another episode. <laughs> Can we pop somebody's head off in a later season, yes. maybe? I don't know. Uh, Jerseyville gives us also what I believe is our first First Nations person in a Murdoch. A man in a bowler hat walking off a train? Yep, who's clearly actually a first person, a First Nations person. Yeah, who silently walks off a train yep. wearing a hat. Uh, he does appear near the workshop also, but then goes in a door. Okay. So they are taking a train between Toronto and Jerseyville Mm -hmm. that must run fairly regularly because Murdoch says he'll be back on the four o'clock. Well, I think that's also another joke because where Jerseyville, if it's supposed to be in the Rouge River Valley, the way the Rouge River is, is it's supposed to be like the equivalent of Scarborough. Mm -hmm. So it's like a commuter train. Okay. Because there's trains that run back and forth to Scarborough all day, right? They're called go trains. Now? Yeah. But would there have been in 1895? I have no idea. And how long would it have taken? What do they go? 10 miles an hour? Slightly faster than walking? 40 miles an hour at this point. <laughs> yeah. Easily. Ooh, that's so 40 fast. or 50 miles an hour. Well, if it's only 20 miles away, yeah. it would take 30 minutes. Yeah. That's not bad. It still takes 30 minutes. You got to get through all the city. Then that's reasonable then. Yeah. That they're going back and forth on the train. Yes. So Henry's sister says he was a recluse. Henry's sister should say, I'm the most useless character in this episode. (laughs) I'm a super snob and I give no information. Okay. When the cops come and talk to you about a person who has had a suspicious death in your family, you should be leading with, he said people were trying to get him. Mm -hmm. That's what you should be leading with. You should at least stop folding the doilies long enough to answer their questions. She doesn't seem to care. Yeah. That's French people for you. They're cold. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I think that's what we're supposed to think. I should have believed him. No, you should have led with that. (laughs) Murdoch would have been out the door in five minutes. Well, there were people trying to kill him. (laughs) And there was that guy. And their names were. And that what? There was that guy who came and had a weird accent and asked me all the questions about him and then mentioned to Shaq. What? How does that even come up in conversation? And how did they know where the Shaq is? <laughs> oh, there's only one Shaq in Jerseyville, Mark. Oh, okay. Obviously, it's that Shaq. That says Gaston's Workshop, which is not a Shaq. It's Gaston's Workshop. That's a barn. Okay. But, but the Shaq, where the confidence man has oh, been saying, right. is actually a Shaq. Yes, that's right. But it's the Shaq, apparently. The Shaq. Okay, then we get some great George and Murdoch. Oh, the horses? The horses. Gertrude and Whitey. Gertrude, named after the owner's mother. Yes. And we get slapstick George. Trying to ride a horse. Trying to ride a horse. And he said that he learned on a Shetland pony. Can you ride a horse? Uh, I don't really like horses all that much, but I have ridden them. I've never been on a horse. A pony, a donkey, nothing. Ever. I think I would be terrified. And then we get another piece of fantastic Murdoch. That horse is named after the owner's mother. And the first thing that popped into my head was a a horse named after your mother. Madonna? Yes. (laughs) This is Madonna the horse. It should have a pointy bra on. (laughs) 
Not that my mom wears pointy brows. No, but most people would hear Madonna, the horse, and think she's Vogan or something. Again, growing up in the 80s with a mother named Madonna was an interesting situation. <laughs> and then there's Whitey. He's all white. He's all white. <laughs> and brownie and blacky and gray. Hmm. George exaggerated his prowess. Mm -hmm. Then we get another great George and Murdoch thing. Oh, and they're talking about the human cannon? Yes. Because George's first theory is that Gaston was shot into the tree from a cannon. Which is not his craziest (laughs) theory. No, it's not his craziest theory. It's not even the craziest theory, because I think Murdoch's zipline theory later is just as crazy. I think the cannon is more likely than the zipline. <laughs> so while they're on the horses talking about the cannon, and Murdoch gives away something that surprises no one, that he was a fuddy dud even as a child. Yes, he talks about the great Farini. There's a, a pair of people, I have a screenshot of it, off to the side, yes. who are in modern clothes. Oh, they're in modern clothes? They're carrying plastic bags, and I think one of them's wearing a bike helmet. Oh. Yeah. They're just randomly standing wow. over there. It must be so hard. It's got to be so hard. <laughs> so hard to control for that kind of thing. So great Farini, real dude. Is he? The, he's the one with the cannon that George says he saw? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, 19th and 20th century Canadian phenomenon. Foon an ambulist. Do you know what that is? A phenambulist? Yes. No, I don't know. It is someone who walks on a tightrope. Oh. He did Niagara Falls. Oh. Yeah. He and, was a serious guy. And got shot out of a can? Yeah, he went over Niagara Falls and then took part, actually, as a kind of spy in the American Civil War. He, he's totally like a Terrence Myers kind of guy at some point. <laughs> then... When he was older, he walked across the Kalahari Desert by himself, expected to be the first white person to do it. Why? Because he did crazy things. I guess. He was he was definitely an interesting cat. Well, the cannon is a trick. Yes. We know that. They know that. But the person is still shot out of it. Yes, I know it's not a cannon, Murdoch, but the person is still flung through the air. Onto a net. Remember when we saw that in Colorado? We mm-hmm. saw somebody doing that? That's crazy. It was super cool. Yeah, I don't care if it's a spring or an explosion. Either way, I don't want that to happen to me. No. I'm not up for that. Still counts. Gaston's workshop is amazing. I inspected the equipment. (laughs) 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 That's such a great George joke. (laughs) It's like uh, in Poirot when Hastings says the baby picture of Poirot looks like he's about to address a board meeting. Yes. I think Murdoch's probably the same as a child. Absolutely. He's very serious. So Gaston's workshop. Is amazing. Yes. It is a set dresser's dream. A gyroscope, an hourglass, a telescope. Lots of charts. Shotgun. Tell And uh, the, the map. Yes. On September 9th. Cow. Cow. <laughs> that map is nuts. September 15th. Cow. Lights. <laughs> yeah. And then he's got a list of the distances between the moon and the earth on different days. Yeah. Which he can't be calculating on his own. I'm sorry. You just, he could not be doing that. But I, I mean, I guess he can look them up. I guess. At certain points, you know how far away the moon is. Yep. And there's a telegram or a letter here from the Rouge Valley Land Company. That letterhead is beautiful. Okay. There's so much in this letter. The letterhead takes up a third of the page. First of all, it's from Rosebank, Ontario. Okay. Which is nowhere near there. Okay. Which is further away than Tor- from Toronto than Ottawa. We said. Than, tr- than Toronto. We're suspending so, geographical disbelief. I, again, I do not know where the offices of this place are. It clearly says on it, Terrence Myers. Mm-hmm. Yep. July, well, he's using his own name. July 16th, 1895 is the date on it. It's super interesting. There's a lot there. And this is where we get our first reference to P. Percival Lowell, I Mm -hmm. think, and the canals of Mars. So do you know who Percival Lowell is? He's the guy who discovered there are canals on Mars. Well, they're not actually canals. (laughs) No, but we call them canals. They're scars, more or less, right? Uh, He had a speculation that there were canals on Mars, which proved to be false. Right. But he also theorized there was a ninth planet in the solar system, which uh, for a while was true because he thought that there would be something in Pluto. He founded uh, the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, and 
form the where they began to look for Pluto, which was discovered 14 years after his death. Influence on huge amounts of people, Eric de Rice Burroughs, Bray Bradbury, that whole sort of set of he's really the guy who popularized Mars as an invading situation. And he was doing that in the late 1800s. Yeah. So between him and like the sci-fi boom in the 1950s. Yeah. He must have had, he had a big influence for a long time. Yeah, 1855 minds. to 1916 are his dates. He uh he he also he also has an incredibly interesting mausoleum. It looks like an observatory. Oh, that's cool. Like it has a dome on top? Yeah, it has a dome on top. That's it's super very cool. cool. It's super cool. And this is our first sort of hint of things we learn later about George, that he's fascinated with sci-fi and space and... Adventure. That comes that into... That sort of adventure Yeah, that comes into play later. So I wondered whether this was an anachronism in the timeline. So were people actually that interested in outer space and UFOs in the 1890s? Yes. Or is this... That's a valid question. Is this the writers sort of transposing later interests earlier for Murdoch's purposes? Yes. And so I looked into UFO sightings in Canada in the 1890s. Okay. There was this big thing in the Midwest in the United States in oh. the 1890s okay. that extended up into Canada in some places called The Great Airship Mystery. Okay. And they are absolutely making a reference to this. Okay, cool. For like six months, this huge swath of North America, people were seeing the this weird UFO in the, in the sky at night that had lights that changed colors and it was like triangular and then it was square and... People were seeing it and reporting it all over the place. Of course, communication was really bad. So it, it wasn't until much later that people kind of strung these together and realized yeah. in all these disparate places, people were seeing a similar thing. But the weirdest part of it is that there was some kind of radio signal coming from this airship. Okay. And it's not a blimp. We think of airships as blimps. Yeah. That's, that's, it wasn't blimpy looking <laughs> the way they described it. But somehow or another, people figured out that it was sending signals and some, and I'm having trouble finding the details on this. So just fill in the blanks for yourself. Somehow or another, people figured out it was sending a message that was to Edison. Oh. But then Edison said, I got nothing to do with that. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So either Edison had a blimp, an airship of some sort. Yep. And pretended not to, or aliens were trying to talk to Edison, or somebody mistranslated whatever this message was. I so don't we know. still don't know what it was, actually? Oh, there's like 10 books written about it. Oh, wow. I couldn't find any of them open source or anything to skim through the... And there's no like nice concise summary of it that yeah. tells you how it ended. Well, it's not, it's not crazy to think that the government's of the time were exploring lighter than aircraft. This thing would have had to travel like from Kentucky to north of Toronto. Wow. For everybody to have seen it who saw it. Well, it could have been multiple flights or something. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But they've got to be referencing that. Well, now they in use this balloons episode. in the in the Civil War. So, right. So But but that's that's not what people saw. No, I know. It wasn't a balloon. I know. The Great Airship Mystery, if yes. you're curious. 1890s. It's clearly it being referenced. Yeah, it. yeah. So then we get to go to the Rouge Valley Land Company. And we meet. To Mr. see Terrence, Terrence Myers, Myers in his own environment. <laughs> Looking fancy in his offices. Yes. Denying everything. If, if a plan goes poorly, we just scrap it and start something new. He wouldn't what? sell. Gaston wouldn't sell. So. Why is he there? Why are they doing this? Why? I don't know. So, again. This is supposedly the cover for what they're doing. Yes. So, we spoil stuff, right? So, we're supposed to believe that the Canadian government pretends to be buying up all of the property in a valley to provide cover for a blimp they're building. Yes. So, they have an open area to fly their blimp around. Yes. Okay, that seems over the top. There's a lot of open area in Canada. Well, spending six hundred dollars for two hundred acres of land is insane. Insane. At this, point, yeah. at this point in time, 
Aren't there plenty of open spaces in Canada there where they could have flown this thing and nobody would have seen it? Plenty of open spaces <laughs> in Canada. I mean, to this day, I think you could yes. do it and nobody would notice it. Maybe on radar yeah. somewhere, maybe. Maybe. But it was a low-flying you know, airship, so it wouldn't even like interfere with planes. It, it was makes, like right above trees and stuff. Makes no sense that it they're makes doing no that. sense. But, of course, we get to see Myers and his expert denial of everything because, you know, he is government. Yes. So, Gaston's journal has all kinds of clippings and George sketches George is on in the it. case. Strange, foot, strange footprints in area is the first In clipping. Perth County. Okay, we'll get to Perth County. <laughs> there are two more before Perth County. Okay. So, strange footprints in area. Police ask for help in demanding, determining identity of creature. Individuals question whether the prints are of Earth origin. That is purposely put in for later on. Right. Okay. Mysterious field circles puzzle scientists. No known origin, possible alien life forms. International experts discredit invader theory. Later on. Yes. Strange happenings in Perth County. Perth County is easily 300 miles in the wrong direction. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well, Gaston might have been collecting any kind of clippings from anywhere in Canada, eastern Canada. Maybe. You know. Strange black shapes move straight up rapidly. Okay. That's what's in the, uh, in the article. <laughs> black shapes. Why isn't his journal in French? I don't know. I mean, unless his sister's French, but he's not. <laughs> <laughs> She's just annoying. <laughs> I would think that his would be in French, too. Now, let me tell you the difference between a motto and an aphorism. <laughs> Poor Brackenreed. Yep. It just, I will spoil this. The chief constable is a bad guy, okay? Yep. If you can't tell, he's a jerk face. Never mind the fact that he's how not... does he teleport to the office wherever it is? <laughs> <laughs> and he is just as bad as you think he is. Yep. He's bad dude. So he's he's not doing a difficult job here keeping things secret, you know, and having to do things for the government. He's just a bad guy. But, you know, Bracken Reed is getting the pressure. Yeah. But he tells Murdoch, follow the money. Yep. Right? Because if Gaston won't sell, then that means the plan doesn't happen. And there are other people who might have been excited to sell and now won't get any money. And it turns out to be the McIsaacsons. The McIsaacs. Yeah. McIsaacs, Jake and Kirk, but that's not their real names. But no, because they're not even real. No, which but again, they have a quite a shock for not being real. <laughs> okay, so they're plants, right? Yep. They're American military. Yep, faking. No one's Royal Navy. There's one English oh, and one okay. American. So, but wait a minute. When he talks to them in the blacksmith shop, does one of them have an American accent? No, no. Okay. They both have Canadian accents. They're both doing Scottish accents. Why are they all connected? To, you know, to, uh, <laughs> so the government is so invested in taking over the Rouge Valley that they have planted two men to pretend to be blacksmiths. Yep. For what reason? I do not know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And they obviously have blacksmith skills because they're actually maybe, running a blacksmith. Maybe they're helping in the creation of things that are needed for the airship. That's the only thing I can think of. Okay. And nobody notices them using their smithy to make airship parts. Or alien feet. When they should be making like boot jacks and pot hooks the, for, this, for these pioneer people who this were there. This episode <laughs> is missing Something. them with the alien feet on jumping yes, around. Yes, yes. I want to see that. The metal golf ball feet. Yeah. <laughs> they have this hammer that is like a stamp of dragon scales. Yeah. Or like lizard scales. And I, for the life of me, I was like, I don't know why a blacksmith would have that. Yes. Why would they have it? I don't know. And I looked around online and I did find places selling that exact piece of equipment, but I could find no place where anybody's putting it to use. It's just design, isn't it? But what does a blacksmith make that needs the texture of scales? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> Alien feet. That you'd hammer on because yeah. you have to heat the metal, put that thing on it and basically whack it to stamp yeah. it. 
and then move it and do it again. It would never be continuous scales. No. It would always look like a rectangle of scales. And plenty of people make metal dragon scales for things, you know, or like chain mail -y kind of things, but not things that just have the texture of lizard skin. It's weird. I don't get, I don't get why it's they have very it. very strange. Um, I guess, you know, maybe these two invented it. Maybe. And now, you know. It's standard kit. I don't know. So here we get discussion of the creepiest part of the episode, which is someone is in the corn watching me. That's honestly creepy. Well, children of the corn. Yeah. yeah. They find the Martian prince, and then there is mention. Oh, wait. I just figured out why the McIsaacs are there. Why? They're there to freak Henry out. Oh, okay. How did they know Henry? Oh, yeah. That they're, they're freaking Henry They're just there out. to freak Gaston out. Yeah. That's and make parts for the airship. I guess. I guess. And be heavies at the end of the episode. Yeah. Okay. So they're purposefully creeping him out by walking around in fields, you know, strange lights, the, the, footprints. There needs to be video of them with the marsh. There should be. Yeah, there should be a scene of them lurking around with a lantern in the cornfield wearing the shoes. You know. Yep. Walking like around Roxanne. in the dirt. Exactly. Occam's razor. Do you know who Occam is? No. Occam is not a person. What? Occam is not a person. Occam's razor is the idea that the simplest answer is the correct one. It's a philosophical idea put forth by William of Occam. Occam is a place. Oh, okay. Do you know where it is? It's like um, uh, Da Vinci. Yes. He's Leonardo oh. of Vinci. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know where Occam is. It's in England. Oh. He's an English guy. I Makes sense. William of Auckland. William. He's not from Auckland. Yes. He's from Ockham. William of Ockham was born in 1287 and died in 1347. Really old dude, too. Absolutely, uh, you know, wrote a whole bunch of philosophy books. and It wouldn't be the same if they called it Willie's Razor. Yes. <laughs> so they have to call it Ockham's Razor. And, of course, because he's before Reformation, he's a Catholic priest. Mm. Then we get to see crop circles. Yes. Two real ones and two and three CGI ones. There's a lot of CGI in this. Yes. Yeah. So, which makes sense because it, they're, they're not easy to make. And they ruin crops. They do. And there's no naked guy for Midsummer. In no! When, when do you think crop circles started? Well... Always in these shows, when they find a crop circle, there's a montage of these crop circles have been found in crops since the time of primitive peoples. I'm going to say crop circles are probably a 20th century thing. They aren't. Oh. And you should know this. Okay. Because in the midsummer that you're referring to, where the naked man gets found in a crop circle. Yes. We talked about the mowing devil. Oh, right. The Remember mowing devil, the, the pamphlet. The, there was a picture of yes, the Yes, of the mowing devil. Yes. It's from the 1600s. That's right. The now, mowing the devil. mowing devil mowed circles. He didn't bend. Yeah. And the people who study crop circles and other things to do with with plants like wheat and corn are called cereologists. Cereologists. Because they study cereals. Yes. Okay. C cereal plants. Okay. Yeah. So the mowing devil might have been a cereologist. A localized wind shear. <laughs> yeah. That's not swamp, possible. It's swamp gas, Murdoch. Yeah. It's swamp gas. I love how... He's talking about a tornado. He's talking about wind shear. Yeah. Like a small tornado. George does a good job here going, uh, I climbed a tree and looked at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what Gaston was trying to do. And then they... But th there was no crops in that. Field. Maybe. Maybe not. The footprints are a curiosity. I, I can't explain them. In Gaston's workshop on his map, he has a note about footprints and he has a little drawing of them. Yeah. They have way too many toes. They're... It is unclear how many toes these footprints have. Well, it looks like five in his drawing, but yeah. it's clearly three yeah. from the actual footprint. But George makes a nice plaster cast. He does. It's and clearly golf balls. It's clearly the arts and crafts section because <laughs> Murdoch is also getting arts and crafty. Yeah. He gets in a montage. By the way, this is the beginning of the montages of montages of montages. Yeah, because the first half of this episode kind of crawls and then they're like, okay, speed it up. Come on, let's go. And we got to have lots of montages. Yes. The next arts and crafts moment is Murdoch's zipline diorama. <laughs> Bracken Reed looks at it and goes, 
What the hell is this? It must be a two Martian operation. Yes. That is a fantastic <laughs> joke by Bracken Reed. You want to guess when uh, zip lines were first used? Zip lines. And I'm going to specify for purposes of entertainment. Okay. Yes. Because people in lots of different geographies have been using ropes to carry things over distances. At so, height, but okay. So... By zipline, you mean there's an apparatus that people ride down a rope over a chasm. Using gravity. Yes. As the, as the power, the and force behind it. just a rope or a rag thrown over top of it? Well, or it could be a, something else, but it's not a, um, there's not like a carriage or a okay. car or something. It's, it's also like known you- as a flying fox or a death slide. <laughs> If you said, hey, let's go death sliding, I would say no. No. If you said, zip, let's go zip lining, I'd probably yeah. say no too. But you want to guess? No. 1739. Wow. When a guy named Robert Cadman, who was a steeplejack and a rope slider, okay. so he did this for a living, but he decided to do it for fun once. He descended from the Shrewsbury St. Mary's Church in England on a, like a dare, basically. Yeah. So he, he hooked a rope up from this it's a cathedral basically uh down to the ground and he was gonna slide notice i said he was (laughs) he was gonna slide down it this doesn't sound for fun and the rope snapped and he died but that's the first zip lining for entertainment (laughs) i would not be entertained by that i don't think even people watching were entertained i I think think it was probably a pretty messy affair yeah Poor Robert Cadman. He tr- he was trying to invent something fun. It's also mentioned in The Invisible Man. Oh. There's zip lining in The Invisible Man. I didn't know that. I did not know. Which is 1897. Bovicide. No. See, now. This is not bovicide. This is dramatic jelly pointing. <laughs> so, there's a blob of jelly of all, on a piece of fake fur, and there's a finger, and it just zooms and zooms. For- look, look. Look, I'm pointing. I'm pointing. We look, gotta look, deal look. with the feet before. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, the feet that are up in the air. We never actually see a cow at all. Okay, those we feet see... are way too close together. We see hooves. Yep. <laughs> stuck up in the air, because you know when calves when cows die, they just like a bug stick their legs up in the air. It's not how it <laughs> That's works. That's not how it works. <laughs> and then we get jelly pointing. Yep. Look, jelly, jelly, blob, jelly, jelly, blob, blob, jelly. Uh, it's bloat. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes they explode. Which, (laughs) having experience with bloat, it is horrific. Yeah. (laughs) And you do sometimes have to vent a cow, right? I have been there when a cow has been vented. They stick a big tube in it, It is not... A pleasant smell, I assure you. Oh, but the cow must feel so much better the, after. The cow shrinks before your eyes. Yeah. It's stunning. And is there a big fart sound? No. <laughs> right, because the fart sound is like from the flapping, right? Yeah. If it's a tube, it doesn't. No, no. Because they don't, they don't put a rubber end on it to <laughs> flap around. <laughs> well, that's how you'd know that it's done when it stops. <laughs> Or like a like a kazoo, you know, like a party I've a heard party that, whistle or something. I've heard. <laughs> I haven't seen this, but I've heard people who have lit it on fire when it's coming out. Why? Because it's like a fart. Just to burn it off. Just to burn it's it so off. bad. Because boy, it stinks. But what if you get a backflash? I just <laughs> cow everywhere. Poor cow. I have no idea about cows exploding, but like it is not. When you see a bloated cow compared to a normal cow, mm-hmm. you're like, "There's something wrong with that, that cow." That cow's going to explode. Like, it's don't e- poke that cow. It is absolutely easy to see that. Elmer, but, get away from that cow with your stick. But still, Murdoch <laughs> is just carrying out all the excuses. Like he should say, "Swamp gas," and he's Heineman and all over this yeah, thing. It's, yeah. it's just swamp gas. It was a reflection off of the moon. It was a meteor. Yeah. It was a crashing satellite. Those those don't exist yet. <laughs> <laughs> and no, it's is a, like, no, this is where. No, it's a blob of jelly. You can see it right here. I'm pointing to it. Look at That's the my blob finger. of jelly. <laughs> so we're supposed to believe that in order to throw the police off, Myers has killed a cow in yeah. some way that they can't tell. Yeah. 
laid it on its back and hooked his shop vac up to suck its guts out. A shop vac that they have no explanation. <laughs> oh no, they use it to deflate the balloon. Okay, that's what they use it for, but there's no explanation of how that works. No, no, no. <laughs> Why it puts the hooves in the air? It's it's hooked up to a bike, and you have to pedal. I guess to suck the air out. <laughs> Well, you can't just plug it in. There's no electricity in Jerseyville. Come on. It's 1850 in Jerseyville. She she comes by train just to see the jelly blob cow. Yep. <laughs> like George calls well, her. George sends her a telegram. George sends her a telegram or calls her and says. She's in the morgue listening to Daisy Daisy. He gets the telegram. Come out to see this cow. <laughs> it's had its gut sucked out. And she's like. I'm there. I'm on it. Well, Murdoch is there. Yes. How's she going to make googly eyes at Murdoch Aww. if she doesn't go to Jerseyville? We'll get to the googly eyes. To see the jelly blob cow. Well, they might be smarter than us, but I have a feeling they're a great deal uglier, George says about Martians. Because <laughs> <laughs> if this is what their feet look like, what does the rest of them look like? And George is so fantastic. This is a trope of George that they play with through all the seasons, which is George has a crazy idea, some of which are like that are true. Mm -hmm. Like there's a point where he goes, I wonder if they should have a giant tower in downtown. In, yeah. In Toronto. Down, downtown Toronto. So. But he is he is one of those kids who grew up reading fantasy yep. and sci-fi kind of yep. stuff. and. Yep. Absolutely. He's all into it. Those ugly Martians with their golf ball toes. Then the train gets stuck. Oh, it's, it oh is I guess just we'll so, all have to stay in Jerseyville it's now. It's so dun, 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 And then the train got stuck. And then the aliens came. And then like it's then there's so another murder much like that. Yeah. So there's another murder. And, and this, Julia is wearing Miss Pencil's hat. Yes. She's wearing the escaping bowler. She's wearing the escaping bowler. <laughs> She's got it tied tight. And there is a shot. I have a picture of it of Murdoch examining the body and uh, Bracken Reed behind him, uh -huh. and th which is like the director storyboarded it out and like has reference pictures it's from under room. a bridge. The it's, body's it's, laying there. We have the escaping hat. Bracken Reed looking so judgy in the background. wanted that picture, <laughs> that shot. He's like, he lingers on it. I'm like, yeah, that's a favorite shot of yours right there. Bracken Reed's looking real trim in this episode. He is. He, he is looks a, great. Yeah. And when they have to stay overnight and he's out smoking his cigar, he's yep. got his, his uh, necktie off and his jacket all loose and... It's looking pretty handsome, I thought. Yep. This is where the shack gets mentioned. They find the disguise kit. How does that come up in conversation? I'm looking for your brother. Well, I'm not going to tell you where he is because I don't trust you and I think you're creepy. I'm staying in a shack. Bye. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> how does that... <laughs> I'm looking for your brother like I was looking for a no, shack. No. I found a shack. I'm, I need to find your brother. I'm looking for your brother. <laughs> And I have a shack. I have to have the faintest Parisian accent. Yes. Would you like to visit me at my shack? Yet another montage. Okay. Here at the shack, we find that it's Claude Benoit, the confidence man. They realize who, why they all recognize him because he's Chekhov's, He's got a box of mustaches. He's Chekhov's confidence man. <laughs> but because they're stuck in Jerseyville, Julia has to perform the autopsy on Benoit in Jerseyville. So where does she do it? In Gaston's workshop. Yeah, I don't know why she does it there. I guess because it's blacked out, the the windows are covered, so Maybe. she's got privacy. I guess. But she has to go to the general store and buy all the supplies. Yeah. Now, she's a doctor, so I'm sure she carries quite a few pieces of equipment in her yeah. bag. So everything on her tray, I'm going to give her. Yeah. Right? She had that stuff with her. But she goes in there. She's like, I need a tarp. I need a, a saw. I need alcohol. I need a bucket. I'm going to use the bucket for guts. I need quick lime. I need, <laughs> yeah. I Meanwhile, need the person in the store is and like, a sturdy needle. You're a woman who's not married who I don't know, and you have money. You must be a prostitute. Or a witch. Or a witch. Well, she's clearly going to kill somebody. <laughs> yes. I need a gut bucket and a tarp and some bleach and, like, suspicious. <laughs> Meanwhile, Murdoch is like so out of excuses. He's like, well, there's no Martians in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> what? And that's why they're, they don't exist. Like, I'm like, 
Colin Fowl on Murdoch because he would have thought better than this. Well, the victims' viscera have been evacuated. In the middle of this incredibly Ew. fast second part, let's wander around in the night in the dark. Well, I don't get rom- to smoke at home. It's romantic. I don't get to smoke at home or let my hair down. So we're supposed to think Julia was just out walking around in her shawl with her hair down, which she would not have put down if she'd known she was going to run into murder. No. I'm just glad the gazebo has lighting in it. Montage, montage, montage. The Jerseyville gazebo is very well lit. Plus, gaze- there's a rumble in the distance. Gazebo is fun to say. Well, there's a UFO. <laughs> Before that, in the discussion of religion and Martians, yes, George says something about Martian Jesus. Yes. And I'm just going to give a little public service announcement here. Yes. Don't Google that. Oh, okay. <laughs> you Googled Martian genius? Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a QAnon black hole of awfulness. Oh. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. I'm glad I did it in incognito mode. Okay. I thought, oh, I'll find goofy people who think Jesus was from Mars. That'll be fun. Yep. It's not fun. No. Don't go there. Okay. And this is not one of those, whatever you do, don't press that button because it's fun things. No, no. I'm giving you advice. Yep. And then, yes, you can't deny it because look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's a UFO. It's their X-Files moment. Follow that UFO. Yep. Absolutely. They go to the map to figure out where it went instead of just following it. Following it, yeah. The map already has a bunch of red dots right where it is. So they don't need to put the nuts on the map to mark it. But, I mean, Benoit already did that. Benoit, sorry, Gaston already did it. We found it, George, at the seventh line and concession 51. Why is it called a concession? Okay. The reason why it's called. Is that a plot of land? Yes. Okay. So in Upper and Lower Canada, concession roads were laid out by the colonial government through underdeveloped crown land to provide access to rows of newly surveyed lots intended for farming of new settlers. They were conceded by the crown. You've told me about this. Yeah. When you when you told me about going out yonder in your parents' farm field, that there was a road like every so many miles because those were concession roads. The lines. When you have a line of so that's the, a, a the border county, of a plot of land. When you have a line of the county, that's every mile. There's another line. Okay. So, th- so they are seven miles from the county line, mm-hmm. and fifty-one concessions in the other direction. Now, sometimes it's it's different directions. It's usually north south, but it's different okay. directions based on. And they are both for the county and the the township. Gotcha. So it may be... So it's like a mile marker. Yeah, it's like a mile marker. But I would suggest that this, especially this one right here, seventh line, concession 51, which is, of course, a reference to Area 51 Mm -hmm. with aliens. Roswell. Confirms that my crazy conspiracy theory about the tower on the location on the map when they had the chess chess pieces, that they put that in too. I think so. I think I think you're right. Obviously, they're having some fun. Now, in the second half of this, they were like, let's have all sorts of fun. Like, they were going nutsy bobo here. Something happens I don't understand. Okay. So they see the UFO. They go to Gaston's (laughs) workshop. Miraculously, the body's gone now because they put the map on the same table where the body was. Remember, they're stuck in Jerseyville because the train isn't running. Yes. But then Brackenreed says... Well, I'm going to go to the Rouge Valley Land Company. How does he get there? Where is the office? (laughs) Because I thought it was in Toronto. That was the impression I had. Because Murdoch is in the station and then he goes to the office. But the the chief constable is there. So either he's lurking around in Jerseyville. Yep. Or Brackenreed teleports to Toronto. There is geography problems (laughs) with this episode. Oh, no. He says he'll take a carriage back to Toronto. Oh, that's right. That's how he does it. That's how he does it. 20 miles. What would that take him? Like an hour? Maybe. Hour and a half? Something. The chief constable is so super creepy. Yes. Lurking around. Oh, why is he doing that in the dark? He has no reason to know that Brackenreed is coming. No. So he must hang out there all the time. (laughs) In In his uniform, in In, the dark. In the empty room. So creepy. 
Yeah. Meanwhile, a bunch of Russians are building a blimp. Yeah. It's not a language I know. Uh, it's Russian. Is it Martian? Is it foreign? It's Russian. They're just in there going, Das Vidanya, Das Vidanya, Pajalsta, Das Vidanya, Babushka, over and over again. And we're introduced. Why do they put the board through the handles on the I outside? I don't know why. They also like come right through the door. Like anybody would be able to see them instantly. It's just no trespassing, no entry, whatever. There's two big handles on yep. this field, on this, uh, the yard yep. that they're in. The handles are on the outside of the door, and there's a bar through them. It's on the outside. You just take the bar off. <laughs> and they walk through the front door, basically. Wait a minute. How do they get the bar through the handles if they're all inside? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they put it down from the dirigible. <laughs> <laughs> So they're in there welding and stuff on the, the secret blimp yeah. that they just flew over and landed there. <laughs> but, you know, it's got problems and they got to fix it. Myers is like, the whole project's canceled. We got to go. Yeah. And the Russian like, no, no, we can't go until we get our 80 power horse engine, 80 horsepower engine the size of a pig. Yeah. What? What? 80 horsepower is nothing like yeah. i think our lawnmower is more than yeah. 80 horsepower <laughs> our lawnmower is not the size of a pig it's even smaller than a pig <laughs> so then we have meyer's explanation of what happened which is oh. all horrendous to okay. benoit so henry henry gaston. So gaston so now is the time for your gaston song oh you want my gaston now yes yes now i want your gaston song <laughs> Cue me up. No pressure. Okay. No one dies like Gaston. Watches skies like Gaston. No one falls into trees from a plane like Gaston. For there's no man in town half as crazy. His sister says his wits are gone. His thoughts are all in outer spacey. A government blimp and a jump. Now he's gone. <laughs> so that's the actual explanation. Henri was so freaked out. He jumped out. Yeah. <laughs> He wouldn't sell his land, so they couldn't clear the valley to have a clear space to test their blimp. So they tried to creep him out with fake aliens, ending in them abducting him and shoving him into the blimp. He gets scared, he jumps out, and yep. he dies because his scarf gets caught in a tree. He should have just now, granted, taken our offer. If his scarf hadn't got caught, he probably would have died anyway. But my question is, were they all dressed like Martians when they abducted him? <laughs> Again, a reenactment we should be I want seeing. a flashback yeah. of Myers wearing the shoes and like a green lycra lizard printed outfit. Yeah. But then <laughs> it gets worse because we get Benoit's explanation. Well, they also thought that Gaston might have been a French spy. Yes. They knew there was a French spy and they thought it was Gaston. But, but then he jumps out. He dies. They don't even retrieve him. They just no, leave him hanging. They just leave him hanging there. Did they not think somebody would notice and cause all sorts of problems? If they got his body out of the tree, none of this happens. None of this would He happen. just disappeared. Yep. Right? Or they kept the door shut. But then Benoit comes along. He is the French spy. So they kill him by sucking his guts out with a big shop vac. Device used to rapidly deflate the dirigible. That does not exist. That is not possible at this time. Well, There's they could no have, extension cord long enough. But they, they could have made a suction device, and they it could have had it hooked up to a battery. Batteries Electric existed. motors are they, real, they could have had it's that. All so primitive. Well, it point. is the government mark. They're okay. Oh, okay. They have technology that other okay. people don't have, like an extension cord. Yes, and now we're going to make you victims of a Martian attack. But again, they could have just made Benoit disappear. Yes. He was a confidence guy. He had multiple identities. He was a criminal. Yep. Nobody would have missed him. The cops were already on his case. He would have just been gone. Yeah. But no, let's suck his guts out with a shop vac and leave him. What for I want to find. know. What I want to know. Okay. And let's practice on a cow. Okay. First. Yep. So Ari arrives in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Unless he has foreknowledge of where they are, he has no idea where they are. All he has to do is follow Myers. Yeah. That's all he's got to do. Myers is getting on this train five times a day going out to Jerseyville and back. Yeah. It'd be easy to find out where it is. 
They wake up. Elmer, stop that. The Poke the, it with a stick. Elmer and his wife are featured prominently in the, the Murdoch wiki. People really like them. As they should, because yep. they're time travelers from yes. the 1850s. Yes. <laughs> but when you find something that you don't know what it is, you poke it with a stick. Yes. Obviously. They're still drunk. Yeah. <laughs> nice face dirt on. Well, he's face down in the yep. plowed field. Yeah. But then it instantly changes because they arrive at the empty bar. Mm-hmm. It's all been a massive setup. Everything's gone. Yep. I have a letter from the prime minister's office. Yeah. The political em- pressures on Brackenridge. And this is where they just start to pile on. If it's I was going to do something like this, I'd set it up somewhere in the desert. In New Mexico. Like California or New Mexico. Area 51. It's all conspiratorial. Like, they might as well play X-Files music at this point. But then Bracken Reed says, no, I would put it in Wales because then nobody would go there. Is there like a secret government thing in Wales? Bracken Reed says, you're all crackers. You should do it in Wales. Nobody okay. ever goes there. Yeah, right? basically. Which is funny yeah but it's so it's not roswell right roswell is new New mexico Mexico. so what is that joke about well first of all i think it should be suffolk okay he should have said suffolk because that's where rendlesham forest is oh it's rendlesham rendlesham is the 1980 it's an american base in england big ufo flap there we we talked about that in the midsummer episode with the american base. yes but he says wales yeah. So people on IMDb are like, oh, that's a Torchwood reference. Okay, it's not a Torchwood it's not reference. A Torchwood reference. It's a reference to the Broadhaven Triangle. Okay. Or the I'm gonna say Divid. Divid. D Y F E D. Okay. But it's Welsh. Okay. The the Diffid Triangle. Okay. I'm gonna say Broadhaven. How about okay. that? From February to like April or May in 1977, dozens of unrelated people reported seeing a flying saucer in the Broadhaven oh, Triangle, okay. including whole groups of school children. Well, yes. And police people and okay. sailors and all kinds of people. So it's, it was a huge deal there. Yeah. It is, it is Wales's Roswell. Oh, okay. So and that's what that's it's a reference to. I, it's got to be. To this day, the the Diffid police put up with all kinds of crap. Oh, I'm sure they do. So on their website. Can you imagine being a cop in Roswell? I know. On the, the Diffid police website, they have all the FOIA requests, the Freedom of Information Act requests that have been approved for their area. They just put all that information up. So if anybody's got it from any request, they just share it with the world. It's been requested. It's been cleared. Here it is. Yep. And it's everything from like arrest records to the frequency of graffiti and you know common traffic stops yeah. everything is there yeah including and this is a six-year range okay 2005 to two to 2011 okay in diffid yeah 14 recorded ufo sightings 26 ghost reports 11 witches two zombies and two vampires <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there needs to be a television show there. Those those police people are saints. Yeah. Because <laughs> they voluntarily oh work there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> those 11 witches. <laughs> I feel bad for them. She's a witch. Who calls the police when they think they saw a ghost? I don't know. 26 people, 26 apparently. 26 people. Or the same person calling 26 times. So we have all the four principals here. Bracken Reed, George. Julia. Julia. Murdoch. And Murdoch. I think they may have not known if they were going to get renewed or not. I can see that. The end of season one, and they all kind of walk off together. If if this is where it ended, that would have been a good wrap. Well, and it's still city TV at this point in time, which is not the most, like it's, they're on CBC now, which is the moneymaker. What's the equivalent of city TV in the U.S.? Like, Uh, is it like a regional thing? Yeah, it's a regional thing. Okay. But it's Toronto, so. But it would have been like a Chicago station. Yeah. Okay. It it would have been like that. Bigger city, but still fairly local. Yes. Okay. Best corpse. I'm going with the cow. Yeah, the cow is the best. (laughs) Those feet in the air. Because that cow is just feet in a blob of jelly. Do do you have a picture of that? For the yes, yes. of course I do. The, the the feet in the air are just... It would have to be a calf, right? Yeah. Because they're so close together. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be difficult to get all four feet in a shot with The Julia. picture on uh, IMDb is one of the cow feet. <laughs> <laughs> 
and George in the background. After the credits. Yeah. Well, Elmer and his wife are going to plant a crop and it's going to grow up weird. It's going to go weird. <laughs> it's going to be all twisty and purple corn or something. Jake and Kirk go back to their respective countries. Yes. Everything gets forgotten. Poor Henry Gaston's sister. Adrian. Yeah. She's just, uh, I don't feel poor for her. She's just going to keep selling little boots to ladies. I guess. But like she never gets an explanation. I guess not. Maybe. Uh, does she care? I don't know. I don't think she cares. Grumbling criminal grumbles. <laughs> we know Terrence Myers is going to go on oh, to do other Terrence. nefarious government things. The things that Terrence Myers does. Oh man. And and I guess they just they move the airship somewhere else and continue their experiments. Yeah. But it never gets used. It never gets talked in about in a war again. Yeah. or anything, right? And the scientist is never referred to again. They name him here the Professor Pszczynski. Yeah, I think they wanted to use him again, but they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Jerseyville. Poor Jerseyville. Everybody else is like, that was sad. Anyway. Yep. Like, no, ooh, it's a mystery. How did he end up in that tree? No. Nope. Whatever. He was crazy. Yep. That's Henry. He's Gaston crazy, for you. Henry. He's nuts. You can find Mystery Maniacs <laughs> on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and in our email. If you're wa- if you're watching or listening on YouTube, please take the time to subscribe and hit the bell. Next week, June 12th, our interview with Jerry Ewu will be dropping. From Sister Boniface. From Sister it's Boniface. It's going to be lots of fun. Yep. And then June 26th, the day after my birthday, we will be returning with Season 2, Episode 1, Mild Mild West. You're saying that because you think I'm going to forget your birthday? No. You're like not. I did that one time. <laughs> you did one time. But it's been I, years. It's been years since you forgot my birthday. <laughs> Oh, let's go celebrate our anniversary. Yes, let's celebrate our anniversary. (laughs) Bye, Maniacs. Bye, Maniacs. Myers is horrific in this episode. Like, just because you can doesn't mean you should... And wow, that would take days to clean out your vacuum.